It's a pleasure to welcome, uh, welcome you all here. Uh, uh, it's great to see, see so many uh, uh, old friends and, uh, and uh, new people who we hope will become regulars here. Um, uh, we've put together an agenda that uh, we're pretty excited uh, about and, uh, and we hope you will find it uh, interesting and enjoyable and, uh, and informative. Uh, there are lots of uh, very important tech issues on the agenda, both international and domestic, and we've uh, we've tried to uh, in, in in the agenda to uh, to do them as much as much justice as possible uh, uh, in a day and a half. Uh, we kind of have a tradition uh, here at TPI that each year we try to um, uh, get a uh, a distinguished Coloradan to uh, give uh, opening remarks. Um, and actually, this year we're uh, uh, we actually have two distinguished Coloradans to give some opening remarks. We have, of course, we have Phil Weiser, who is both a distinguished Coloradan and an old friend of uh, of TPI, and we are uh, extremely pleased that uh, he's able here to able to join us here because he he's got uh, pressing business back uh, back in the dean's office tomorrow morning, um, and uh, we have. Uh, our board member, Ray Gifford, uh, who uh, is also a distinguished Coloradan, who uh, will give a couple of remarks first. Actually, I'm not going to give a couple of remarks. I'm just going to introduce Phil. And I cajoled Tom about two hours ago into doing that, uh, given that I've introduced Phil more than once and I'm almost out of embarrassing stories about Phil. So I'm not going to talk about uh, Phil's love for multiple beverages, his uh, insane ability to talk incredibly fast, uh, or uh, his cheapness, or his love of the Mets, or his terrible ability to play fantasy baseball. Uh, I'm going to introduce Dean Weiser today uh, with a quick story that uh, happened between me and my son in these last couple weeks. We went and took a vacation, the whole family, and we took a baseball trip. We went to Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. And on the baseball trip, um, I asked Thomas, who's a rising junior, uh, do you want to go visit some colleges? And he said, well, yeah, I think I should probably start visiting colleges. And he came back and said, uh, he would like to visit uh, NYU and Swarthmore. And I, you know, being a parent, he's not going to my alma mater right now. I figured I'm just going to stand back. He's 16. But at, halfway through the trip, I said, Thomas, why did you say you wanted to visit those two schools? And he said, well, Daddy, um, I know that NYU was where Phil went to law school and that he went to Swarthmore, too. And you always say, Phil's the smartest guy you know. <laughs> and so I introduced you this evening, uh, the smartest guy my son and I know, Phil Weiser. <laughs> so I assumed that Ray was going to take advantage of the opportunity to roast me, um, as he has on prior occasions remarkably well. When I left Colorado yeah. to go to Washington, D.C., he uh, organized an unbelievable departure. And one of the highlights was a video he made going interviewing people at casual fast food dining establishments, asking them all, how are you guys going to survive when Phil goes to D.C.? Because your beverage sales are going to go way down. And they all played along really well. Um, a quick, uh, funny, uh, inside joke on that, which is there was lots of different discussions about why people in the White House might have meetings across the street at Cozy, Au Bon Pain, or the now famous Caribou Coffee. The reported reason was because they wouldn't be entered into the White House logs and they'd be off the record. I can tell you in my case that honestly never entered into my mind. There were only two reasons that I was so motivated, and in fact probably met with some of you in those establishments. Uh, number one, first and foremost, because I did enjoy my casual fast food dining establishments, and they changed in Washington from Colorado. So in Colorado, we have Noodles and Company, a Colorado company. 
We have Einstein Bagels, a Colorado company, Chipotle, a Colorado company, Panera, not actually Colorado, but kind of adopted. And those are staples for me. Obviously, in Washington, I had to make do with Cozy, Au Bon Pain, and Caribou Coffee. Now, the, uh, the second reason, by the way, is if you work in the White House as a staff person, you have to wave people in yourself, which means getting all the information and putting it in, and that takes a lot of time. It's a lot easier to say, why don't we just meet at Caribou Coffee? So in any event, Ray gave me this really great salute, and one of the sweetest things he did is he bought me these cowboy boots uh, to help me not forget Colorado. And I experienced two perspectives on the world from my transition to Colorado to Washington. One is a perspective held by Ray, who spent some time heading up PFF and commuting, which is, why would you ever leave Colorado to go to Washington, DC? Some of you here are thinking that right now. Um, the other perspective, many people in Washington said, you're working in the White House. Why would you leave Washington and go back to Colorado? And what I would say is Colorado has enormous physical beauty and the chance to get away from the hubbub of Washington, DC. And so as you all think about, A, making this an annual tradition, and let me echo Tom's admonition, please do. This conference is really special, valuable, and important, so please keep coming back. But come back and see Colorado. And for those of you who haven't talked to Mike about his tradition, uh, I encourage you to do so. Mike is literally every year coming and saying, this year I'll go see the Western Slope, Telluride, Durango. Next year I'll go see um, who knows where, um, Sand Dunes National Park. There's a lot to see in Colorado. It's all gorgeous, and you'll think more clearly. So thank you all for coming to Colorado. Thank you, Ray, for an unbelievable introduction and for part of why Colorado is so welcoming and a great place for me to want to be. I want to say two other quick things, and if people have questions, I'm happy to visit about them. One is talking a little about TPI. Uh, and I've had a perspective on TPI, which for those who haven't known all the history, I mentioned Ray as head of PFF. But Tom, at this point, its president and his true north, represents and is the guardian of something special. His leadership here in this organization is really important. And his ability to have this conference continue through some transitions is really admirable. So I think it's worth taking time. I don't know if it'll happen other times in the program, but let's congratulate Tom. So why is this special? Some of you know this and it's familiar. Others of you have the um, benefit or burden of hearing me give my discourse on this. So let me say a couple things here. One is the importance of principled dialogue and the power of convening. And I want to mention a few people, and I'm going to make the error of excluding others here. So uh, this is meant to be only by example. First, someone who's not here, Tim Uris. For those who were here at a conference that I'm pretty sure you invited him to speak at, he gave a tour de force talk about how to think about privacy regulation. Um, the speech is still worth reading. In fact, Ray and I, when he teaches a seminar, assign it. In that speech, one of his memorable sound bites, one of Tim's gifts is for putting things into a sound bite, was he referred to Glam Graham Leach Bliley as government mandated spam. Um, Graham Leach Bliley, the only thing good you could say about that as a privacy regulation is it forced companies to think about their privacy policies. That's not a small benefit. However, forcing them to write up 20 page notices and send them out every year was bad environmental policy, was bad consumer protection policy, and uh, I, I'm sure that, you know, if they could just put on their website, everyone would have been happier for it. But alas, a number of laws were passed right before the web became ubiquitous, and they haven't been updated since. And so having a dialogue from first principles around a table and smart people together can really help elevate policy discourse, and that's a core value that TPI holds to. A second one I would mention is healthy skepticism and an interest in data. Um, here I can talk about a number of people who are here. Um, let me first mention Bill Kovacic. Bill also followed in Tim's wake at the FTC. And one thing that Bill has been a student of, which I have learned so much from, where's Bill here? Um, is he hiding back? He's hiding, that's what I thought. Is institutions and how they operate. Because all too often, and this is something that economists sometimes fall victim to, 
with all respect to Hal Varian, who I'm sure never falls victim to this, is worrying about the institutions later. So if Tom Hazlitt were here, I would tease Tom about this. He and I have had a debate on wireless spectrum property rights where Tom says, oh, we'll let courts just figure it out. They'll do just fine. And my point is, well, it's not so simple. Um, if you think it is, you might take a look at some of the mess around patent litigation. And we could think twice about whether courts are always the best institution, particularly generalist courts, to handle complex subject matters. So what Bill did with the Federal Trade Commission was spend an enormous amount of time and energy thinking about institutional effectiveness. And he brought that subject internationally, making it comparative institutional effectiveness. For those thinking about the future of telecommunications policy, I would say don't forget about institutions, because institutions matter a lot. And so how you design institutional framework will make a huge impact on the result. Don't just assume away the institutional question or ignore it. Focus on it with a level of rigor, befitting of what Bill brings to the ex exercise. In terms of being rigorous about it, I would say, and this is now to be fair-minded to the economists, Two laws we don't teach enough in law school, the law of supply and demand, and the law of unintended consequences. And those are two really important laws. At Colorado Law, we're working hard to do both. And it's something that is important to bring to bear when you study these policy challenges. Let me mention one more point about healthy skepticism and what TPI also stands for, which is the lessons of history. And sometimes people are quick to uh, overlook them. And so when you think about these networks that we rely on today, broadband networks, wireless networks, electricity networks, it's tempting to look at regulatory oversight and say, let's get rid of government altogether. If you look back into the 1800s and you look at the common law of common carriage, what you see is a principle about a role of government oversight. In that case, it was a fairly modest role of oversight. It didn't actually include interconnection as a requirement, although it included a duty, if you will, for customers to all be served, have access to the network. And that was a lesson that, if you read Richard Epstein, is a very powerful one. So whatever happens in the net neutrality discussion, the idea that there's no form of public oversight, I would say, is not necessarily thinking about those lessons. Similarly, look at the railroads and the challenges they had as sunk cost networks to be recouped. That is a challenge still very much in broadband networks today. I was enjoying some discussion with some of our European friends about how those can be addressed. And we shouldn't ignore those lessons of history. Let me end on a note which comes out of my experience in the White House, which is how important the power of new ideas is. So I was talking to someone who remained nameless who was saying, you know, the policy discussion seems to be going on a lower ebb as the year goes on. And I said that interesting and right now unknowable question is what kind of reset we get next year. As discussions from privacy, cybersecurity, network neutrality, wireless spectrum, get reset, maybe re-energized, maybe reframed. What's so important is that this community can come together for a part of that discussion, because these issues are fundamental to our economy, to our international success, and this community and how robust it is. And I really need to thank some of the international people for coming. Um, the people who I got to see, uh, Luigi, uh, from uh, Italy, uh, Carlos from Telefonica, who is here, and I think also friends from uh, Germany and Brazil. That's really important because these issues around interconnection in our internet-enabled ecosystem are not ours alone. And the discussions at the ITU are ones that I'm glad to see many people are getting nervous about because if you think about institutions and you study the ITU, there's a lot to be discouraged about. Um, and for those who think the FCC is highly problematic, um, you might want to realize we could do worse, which I know is a sometimes not easy lesson for this group to always appreciate, but it's true. Um, so thinking about what are new opportunities for this new world is very much an important part of this agenda for this week. As Tom said, I am tantalized being here because I won't get to be there for them. I will look forward to the report. And I really treasure the relationships with all of you here and the connection to TPI. So, Tom, thank you so much. If people have questions, I'm happy to think about them. Yeah, if anybody wants to uh, ask Phil any questions, he is, he's right here.
before he, before he heads down the mountain. I would say, as a professor, I'm not afraid to call on people, particularly <laughs> friends and former students. See, I knew Harold didn't oh, have a question. Yeah, That's right. right. I can never but Ed's got you beat. Hi, you Phil. Have, you have the you have the um, the I suppose the question really is, in this political season, technology policy in this campaign is non-existent. Um, and I think some have, who were very optimistic at the beginning of the Obama administration about technology policy, have seen it drop down a few notches in terms of priority and importance. Comment. So the first premise is that there are a lot of issues that are top of this campaign agenda. So um, we can have an discussion about what those issues are. I. Uh, have not lost all hope on that point, but um, I will say I saw the movie The Campaign last night, uh, and it was sufficiently like the satire too close to home that it wasn't really that funny. Um, so the, the challenge of keeping technology policy at the top of the agenda, I would say, is of the following kind. We have three major challenges in this country. The first, we are not out of the mess in terms of the recovery and a jobs challenge, and that is getting a lot of attention, deservedly so. Second, we have a long-term fiscal challenge that should make us all scared, and that's getting some attention and is a big deal. Third, we have a long-term technology and innovation challenge for our comparative advantage internationally, and that's almost getting completely overlooked. So, query, why is that? Well, this was one of the great things I was able to really appreciate from our Vice President, Joe Biden, who has the gift of having run for office more than anyone else serving in the, you know, in the executive branch. And there's a great quote that comes from Sam Rayburn after LBJ is talking to him. And LBJ is a little bit in awe of all these new frontier smart people. And Sam Rayburn says, you know, I'd feel a little better if one of them had run for sheriff one time. <laughs> Tom Talkie, who's amazing in many ways, is someone who can uniquely appreciate this. Being able to talk to the American people about issues is a big challenge that tends to be under-supported in the executive branch, particularly when you get, you know, smart academic types or industry types or whatever types who've never ran for sheriff. So one of the challenges about why it's not more front and central, and if any of you can do this, it's another huge gift to our country. How do we talk about these issues? Pick which ones matter to you. Investment in basic science and research, or why are we not letting immigrant entrepreneurs who are building new companies stay in this country, or people who get PhDs from MIT stay in this country. What have you, go down the list. How can we translate the economic importance to our country of these issues into language and discussion and discourse that the American people can understand and so it moves up the agenda? The reason these issues get ignored is because they're hard to break through when people are saying, well, I'm worried about my job today. I don't have a good answer to how we do that. And when, you know, Vice President Biden kind of puts, you know, that to the test, it wasn't like I could readily come up with one. So that's part of the answer. In terms of what the administration was able to accomplish, I, I could say on wireless spectrum, it is to me just an unbelievable experience to have been on the outside saying, boy, this is a really good idea. The TV broadcasters have all this spectrum could be used more efficiently. If we could get some of this in the hands of wireless broadband, it would be you know, a win all around. That actually got passed into legislation, um, which has considerable promise, and most people thought well, that wouldn't have happened. On privacy and cybersecurity, I would say an important agenda has been set and uh, still to be continued. On other issues, uh, in terms of science, the president has spent a fair bit of time trying to raise awareness and support for science education. We in this country should be scared about how we're not training people who are gifted in science and math uh, from within, and we need to be scared that our immigration policy is taking people who could stay here and add value and pushing them away. So this is a really important point, Ed. Uh, I, I think a lot of it is, and it's hard to explain these issues so that it breaks through. On emerging technologies in DC, and I suppose we're, uh, we're in this for the long term. Our interest is the long term questions rather than the short term ones. 
and we're totally nonpartisan. The beauty of these issues is that they're, they're wonderfully nonpartisan, that neither party is interested. And, and this is picking up partly, partly what Jim was saying, but partly you, you refer to, IT, to ITU. Um, it seems to me one of the problems with the US leadership in the global arena is precisely the fact that if you like OSTP doesn't for some reason have the status of OMB. If it did, we'd solve our problems and we would be taken seriously in the global arena and we would be leading the charge in the global debates. Could you talk about the way in which the fact that the US bipartisanly fundamentally discounts the, the strategic significance of the technology related issues um, is fundamentally undermining our capacity to be the leader in the global, the global forum? This is a very rich discussion with a lot of that institutional fabric that, you know, um, befits uh, Bill Kovacic's intellect. So there are a couple different answers. I would say first, it's not quite so simple that OSTP isn't more empowered. So that's um, a shorthand, but I would say there's a lot more to it. On the issues I worked on, I mentioned a few of them. Honestly, they were all a team within the Office of the President and the White House and throughout the administration. And it was, in my experience, really a great team to be part of. It was uh, a pleasure to work with such high caliber people. And I do feel on many of the issues we were working on, we did bring a lot of thought and effective advocacy to them and move the ball forward. Many of these challenges are you're playing between the yard lines, you're not always scoring touchdowns, so it's sometimes harder to know exactly where you are, but I don't think we were absent um, on this field. I would say, secondly, you are onto something, which is lots of times and ways technology policy is dispersed. Now, in Congress, there was, there was an institution called the Office of Technology Assessment, and in one of the great misfortunes, it was ended. Um, most people who studied it closely would tell you it had a great DNA. And it's always a sad thing when you get an agency with great DNA. The Federal Trade Commission, in its current form, comes to mind, and it ends. It's really hard to kill the agencies with bad DNA. So the ICC was alarmed for a long time after it was mostly just um, engaging behavior that was not necessarily helping consumers. But the Office of Technology Assessment, I think most would say, helped produce better policy and bring technology savvy to the Congress. So uh, Newt Gingrich, who is pro-technology, wanted a symbolic statement that they were cutting the budget in Congress. And here's the problem with technology, to use a line that Vice President Biden liked, the future doesn't have a lobbyist. So it was easy to kill it because no one was there to defend it. One reason why OMB is an interesting institution is it is powerful and its uh, equities, which is an interesting word that gets used in the White House a lot for reasons that I still don't totally understand, but its purpose was to try to keep the budget in check. If you could empower more around technology, you could try to help bring more discussion to it, but I think the fundamental problem comes down to what I said before, that it's hard to make the case for the future. The best way to do it is from first principles about what we know about economic growth. That takes real discipline, and that's something that, again, the American people understood somewhat when we were talking about the race to the moon because that was able to break through. A challenge we have today is to make clear we don't have the technological advantage locked up in this country, and using technology to help the people is going to take leadership and commitment and sometimes that's going to take decades to, to bear out. And not always do we have the patience for that. Tom, you, you want to? Phil, we've got a, uh, an ongoing international debate on privacy, big data, um, and all of the issues attendant to that from uh, consumer rights up through technology innovation and the next generation of products and services and industries uh, that maybe we haven't even envisioned on the drawing board yet. In the debate around that, the US finally has the beginning of an entry into the debate with this multi-stakeholder process the administration's launched for a co-regulatory model. But it seems fragile. 
it's not got a lot of stakeholder buy-in. So far, it's kind of been set into the woods on its own to be raised by wolves. Um, not a lot of drive from the administration side on the basis that commerce doesn't have the regulatory authority and therefore it's sort of self-guided. Um, it's pretty important. In fact, given the state of the regulatory debate in Europe, it would be extremely important to have a U.S. entry into that debate that would be meaningful and innovative. Uh, what are your thoughts on how to have this be successful? It's pretty high stakes. Well, thank you for um, that very eloquent discourse and explanation. I am in accord with everything you said. The point I would add to start with is it takes a theory to beat a theory. Many times people are inclined to say, oh, I don't like that model. That's not right for X, Y, and Z reason. I would encourage you all to then have the fortitude to take the next step, which is what, what model would you propose as an alternative? because you have to ask the question as compared to what. So abolish the FCC, fine. Who is going to manage interference disputes in the spectrum? Oh, common law courts will figure it out. That's not a, you know, that's not a flip sort of response. You've got to say, wait a minute, how would that actually work? Similarly on privacy, there is a first principle, which is are consumers comfortable that they can trust all the internet companies to keep their promises and use data in the ways they would reasonably expect. And if the answer is not really, not all the time, we have a problem on our hands. In Europe, they actually would say it much more strongly. We can't trust them at all. And thus Europe is much more apt to be putting a thumb on the scale and apt to look at our companies and say you can't do business in our country unless you're complying with a more restrictive regime so you could make the point, one version of your point is, even if we thought there was nothing to the privacy concern, that consumers totally didn't care about privacy at all, which is a point that occasionally gets made. If you made that point, um, you might still say, but in Europe they actually do care about it, and if our companies to be competitive in Europe, we have to have a way that is smarter than what Europe's gonna do, and so we still have the burden of developing something. So there's, in effect, two reasons to think about this multi-stakeholder idea with seriousness. One is because their consumers want something, and second would be because Europe will do something worse if we don't come up with a more sensible model. So what will it take to actually get more momentum behind this? So one answer is, you know, like this ITU interconnection concern, I think people need to better first understand the state stakes, and companies often have this fantasy that they could just hold off any regulation and do whatever they want. But part of the problem is, if you do that, then you're waiting for the really terrible thing to happen and the really dumb version of regulation to happen. So in cybersecurity, my fear is we'll get some version of cybersecurity the way we get lots of legislation in a hurry after something really bad happens. The ability to deliberate on a regulatory framework with the benefit of some time and crafting it sensibly, experimenting, is something we now have in both privacy and cybersecurity that may not be there in five years. So what's gonna to take to get enough people to the table? I think there are some companies who are getting this. I would love to see more come along. Um, Commerce, right now, I think it's fair, is acting, if you will, as a policy entrepreneur. The Federal Trade Commission has been extremely effective in this space. What the FTC did in privacy in the 90s was to say, we want companies to post their privacy policies, and if they break their promises, we'll enforce it under Section 5. And then Commerce, working with the FTC, likes happening today, and Kathy Brown was there when some of that started, was nudging people along, and the FTC did a great job of coming up with reports by saying what percent of companies have any privacy policy at all. That was a very s s example of smart regulatory oversight that wasn't overly intrusive, was not like Graham Leach Bliley. So I uh, agree with what you're saying, and I think that's something that will uh, come up later in this conference. If there is one, let's just take one more question. Thanks. So uh, you may have kind of answered this, but so what'd you think of how the wireless stuff came out? Uh, <laughs> and um, 
where do you think it goes from here? So first you've got to start from my premise that most people said it was never going to happen. Right? Most people said the broadcasters will give up spectrum out of their dead hands. And when I talked about this idea to my friend Preston Padden, he said the broadcasters will never let it happen. When I first went, when I was working in the White House, talking to the folks at NAB about this, you know, if, if people could be killed with the stares they were getting, I was dead. So the first point is getting spectrum from broadcasters to more productive uses is a win. Was it exactly, what's that? Potentially. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. And I think it's very important to say the steps from here to there are extremely complicated. And for those who haven't looked at the daisy chain of broadcast stations in the Northeast, start being nervous now about how you're going to make all that work. It's going to take incredible economics and intelligence and hard work to come up with a way to do it. But the, the, the gains to trade, to use the economics term, are so great that uh, I do think the FCC can make this happen. I will say, in general, spectrum auctions over the last 20 years is an amazing accomplishment that the FCC should get credit for. Now, next point. The administration and myself would have liked to see more put for unlicensed than ended up coming out. I would say unlicensed spectrum is a similar situation to betting on the future. The people who will benefit from unlicensed spectrum don't exist today. They were going to be less effective lobbyists. The administration also the administration also pushed for more money for R&D, for wireless innovation, basic research. Um, the high water mark was the administration's proposal, and it all went downhill from there. So it wasn't everything I would have wanted, but the fact that something got passed that was as good as it was and contained, the, again, an opportunity for a nationwide wireless network for public safety that also has great promise, I'm encouraged because what the fact that that happened at all says to me, we still can have bipartisan, thoughtful, sound technology policy, which I guess makes me a glass is half full person. Um, and it's great to have people who are concerned that it wasn't everything they wanted, uh, and Harold's advocacy, I'm sure, made it better, which you may or may not be feeling always, but there, um, there is a lot that we should look at this and say, this was an example of what in privacy, cybersecurity, what have you, it can be repeated, and that's something that I would like to see us get to in a, another session. I will say, like many of you, if these issues get either nonpartisan, nobody cares, or partisan, uh, that's not good for the sector, that's not good for our country. These issues should be about resort to first principles, thinking through what can we do to move the country forward. Well, uh, I think it's good, it's good to end on uh, the glass is half full. So th thank you very much, Phil, for a great talk. Um, continue, to, continue to enjoy the the food and the drink, there's lots of it around. Tomorrow morning, breakfast uh, starts at 7.30, and the program starts at uh, 8.30.